my talk today is really a message of condemnation. Um, but that's not, it's not going to stop there. It's got an appeal for redemption. And I'm going to offer all of you the hope for salvation. So what, I, what I'm disappointed in is our culture around security. Um, and I want us to do better. As, as people working in software, there's some shared competencies that, competencies that are just sort of expected. Um, and if you're new, it's OK if you don't have all of them yet. We help each other out, and you, know, you build that up. But there are certain things that you need to know how to do. So for example, a few years back, maybe uh, going back a little bit more than a decade, not everyone working professionally in software was using version control. If they were using it, they weren't very good at it. And that sort of shifted, right? There was this big cultural change. There was an explosion of version control systems, um, several generations of them. And nowadays, everyone is expected to be fluent in version control, even designers. Like, if you're working in software, you're expected to sort of know how to use version control. Um, today, we've been talking a lot about data and distri distributed systems. And a new emerging competency that is required is fluency with distributed systems. You don't have to design distributed systems, but you need to sort of know the moving parts and how to correctly apply them. So what I'm here to talk about is security and to make the case that we need to change, to, like together as an industry, our cultural view of security, in the, just in software in general. Um, so I've actually got two quotes from The Guardian in here, so that, that works out nicely with Phil's talk. Um, this quote uh, from Cory Doctorow in 2008. 2008. That was quite some time ago in internet, internet years. It's more important than ever to safeguard the data that's been entrusted to us. So we're at this really interesting point in time where our ability to generate and store and process data has developed way faster than our ability to appropriately safeguard it. And we're, we're trying to catch up. So it reminds me a little bit of like the Industrial Revolution, looking back at that period in history. Um, we figured out how to make all this amazing machinery and do all of this cool stuff and accidentally kill lots and lots of people. And then we sort of figured out how to add safety into the mix and, and change things a little bit, and it, it leveled back out. And, and that's, that's where we're at with security right now. We're, we're all here at SPAN, and so most of us in the room probably have access to scary amounts of data. And all of us, for sure, have massive influence on the design of systems that process that data. And we also have, a, if we have access to the data, we have a really, really major impact in whether that data stays safe or not, um, like personally, like our own operational security. So my hope is that you'll come away from this talk and do a better job at safeguarding the data that you already have a duty to care for. So first, I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about how bad the situation is. It's actually so bad at the moment that it's genuinely stopping people who have figured out good things from being able to work on applying all of this fantastic technology we've heard about today um, to really important life-saving problems like healthcare or um, uh, coordinating responses to emergencies or other really, really important problems. Now, I'm going to offer some ideas for how we can get through this. So in 2008, security was already hard, and then we moved to the cloud, uh, where it just gets way more complicated. Additionally, the security gets harder as you scale the more moving parts. So the last talk talking about all of those moving parts. Where do you put SSL in that picture, right? Well, it should be in all of, the, all of those connections, but it's really, really complicated. And as you start processing more data and you have more people involved and more people with access and more people looking at it, it can be downright paralyzing when you're trying to build something new. So I've, I've, I've actually been inside the cloud. Physically, I have gone inside the cloud, some of the clouds, and they're terrible. They're just, it, it's, they're terrible. One of the reasons that they're terrible is because most of us who build software professionally have been negligent about security, many times criminally negligent, or we've been willfully ignorant. And sometimes the reason that we've been willfully ignorant is because the few other people involved in security have mostly been super annoying about security, <laughs> driving everyone else into negligence. And it's, it's, it's not OK. So here's just a recent example. I just tried to grab something off the top of the news. Two weeks ago, The Guardian reported on Whisper. Um, and it's really unfortunate. There's like a good, a good group of systems called Whisper and a bad group of systems called Whisper. Um, so one of them described themselves as the safest place on the internet, completely anonymous, safe, private communication. Uh, it was, tr turns out they were actually tracking and selling user information. When confronted about this, they blew it off and said, oh, it's no big deal. You know, um, well, it is a big deal. 
Uh, the U.S. Senate is conducting an investigation. This is the committee that is over the Federal Trade Commission. And I really hope some people go to jail. Like, it's, it's really not okay. That's just one of the latest examples. There are countless every single week in the news. One other quick example, it's not just quirky chat systems that weirdos are using. It's, it's like the very important core systems that we depend on to save people's lives. So in the US, there are so many health privacy related breaches that the Department of Health and Human Services built and maintains a website that is just a wall of shame. Notifying people, uh, the public in general, about companies who have betrayed the trust of the public. So this is a screenshot for, uh, sor sor sorted by number of affected people. This only reports on breaches that have affected more than 500 people. There are 95 pages so far. So just a couple, it's too small to see, but just the, the top four or five, uh, 4.9 million people affected, 4.5 million people affected, 4 million people affected, 1.9 million people affected. This is stuff that was stolen from a desktop computer, stuff that was stolen from a laptop computer, stuff that was lost by a doctor who was on vacation. It's really, really abysmal. So in the past, the approach to security was like you build something that works and that's great and then you hand it off to operations and you sort of wrap security around it. And that worked for a while in an older generation of systems but it can't just be another team's problem to figure out because the attacks come from everywhere. And so uh, I wanna spend a little bit of time just giving you a taste of what kind of things happen. If I were to go after one of you and try and get some of your information, and I'm not, a, I'm not an expert, there are experts out there who like, work at red, on red teams and professionally break in, um, but I'll just give you a, a sampling of some of the things that happen. So this is a little screenshot, you can't see it very well. Uh, it looks like an air freshener, it plugs in, it's got a network cable. Strange for an air freshener to have a network cable. Um, this is from a company called Pony Express. What it actually is, is uh, Bluetooth and it, it's, it's, a, it's got a, like a 3G network connection. So you go and drop this in a building and then you plug it into the network and you have a separate connection inside the building from which you can run all of your attack tools. You can also see what access points are inside there and pretend to be some of those access points and trick people into connecting to you. From there, it's a pretty short trip to um, stripping SSL and you know, proxying all of the information, grabbing stuff off of there, and, and it, just gets, it just gets worse from there. They've got another one that looks like a power strip. And if you can imagine the, how brief of an amount of time it takes to get physical access to a building, drop off a power strip in a conference room under a table, plug it into the network, and how long would it take for someone to discover that? Uh, it, it's, it's really scary. Here's another thing. This is an actual app you can get in the App Store right now. You can scan your physical keys. Um, this is just one example of when you have a large user base or a large flock of engineers who have access to data, the dangerous things that they will try and do is mind-boggling. And that's just at the office where they're pretending to be responsible. What about when you get home, right, and you don't feel like you need to pretend to be secure? If you're not relaxing, like it doesn't feel like home, right? So the things that people will do. Keys are, have, physical keys have existed for a really long time. And this is a brand new vulnerability because of the cloud in physical keys. So like have your keys ever been out of your control? You have a key to a secure area. Have they ever been out of your control? Like for 30 seconds, long enough for someone to snap a picture? At home? Like have you ever left your keys on the, on the table at home? Um, you can take a picture of a key and get it printed out just from the photo of the key. Like if I snap a photo of your key, I can go get that key printed out. And I've, I've done this, it, it works. This uh, bottom corner is, um, <laughs> this bottom corner is just around, this, around the street here in Shoreditch that is a Maker's Cafe. Uh, it's a really cool place. You can uh, do 3D scanning and laser cutting and uh, 3D printing. So just imagine, you know, I can just walk around the corner and get all kinds of stuff made there. What if I found out that your job gave you access to something that I wanted and I specifically came after you? Like it's just, it's terrifying to think of, of how that happens. So um, there's this thing called Snoopy. It's a proof of concept from 2012. It just assembles a bunch of off the shelf technologies. This is on GitHub. Um, so first you have a drone and a drone could be flying or not flying and it connects probe SSIDs. So we all have phones and we've all connected them to Wi-Fi 
And when you're walking around with your phone in your pocket, it sends out these probes. Like, am I home to connect to my home network? Am I at work to connect to my work network? So I can fly around somewhere where you are, you go by, and I see, I get this probe. And now I know that you have connected to that network before. So then I can create a rogue access point that matches that SSID and let you connect to it. So now your phone helpfully automatically connects to it. Um, I can proxy and log all of your, all of your traffic. Um, I can do man in the middle proxy injection into web pages to steal some cookies or something for a system that you've logged into that you have access to that I want. Um, I can pipe your wireless information through uh, wiggle.net and map that into GPS with Google Maps and get a picture of your house. So from there, I can go camp outside your house and record all of the traffic that's coming out of your house when, you're, when your guard is totally let down. And, and I'm not even good at this stuff. So once I'm camped outside your house and I can mess with your traffic, it's a short journey to having a root shell on your laptop because there is some insecure lap software that you are running somewhere on your laptop and there's this massive list of exploits that I can just download for free and just try and try and try until I get access to your laptop. And I'm not even good at this stuff. Like I said before, there are real professionals that do this. So, so security is, is really boring and awful and doomed. So let's divert and talk about food. So food is awesome, right? We get food from all kinds of places, all kinds of variety. People have different levels of knowledge and effort that go into preparing food. Uh, Sunday, I went and visited Camden Market. And there are all of these food carts. And I saw you could buy food off some of the carts using bitcoins. That was really cool. Um, and they were just cooking it right there on the cart. Um, on, a, on the airplane flight here, they served some food. That was a totally different kind of food, like different levels of training that went into that food. So no effort into making the food good, but lots of effort into making sure the food wasn't a weapon. That was <laughs> different. Um, you know, and, and this is a big city, so there's lots of really fancy restaurants here that have proper chefs cooking exotic foods, really delicious, creative, healthy, fun, expensive. There's also some not so nice restaurants. I actually went into a place that said, we don't sell single sticks of butter. Um, so, so some of these restaurants have widely varying resources, right? You've got the, the food cart, and you've got the fancy, fancy restaurant, and the place that's just selling pre-made food off the shelf. Um, there's different education levels for the people who work in there. Some are you know, life, lifelong chefs and are passionate. Some people just got the job last week. Um, you know, different kinds of customs and, and cultural norms. It's super competitive, right? Like lots of restaurants start, lots of restaurants fail. There's high turnover. There's price pressure, so there's a lot of, a lot of um, requirement to go really, really fast. Uh, most people get absolutely minimal training, right? Like restaurant is one of the classic jobs. Like doesn't matter what you know how to do, you can get a job there. And as a result, maybe the workers aren't so motivated. It may not be the, the happiest place you've ever worked. Um, all the way down to like, um, not even being a restaurant. So like, has, has anyone ever gone camping? Uh, last winter, I went on, I went on a, a hike, uh, went out onto this river, and the, it was really, really frozen. The ice was about a foot thick. It was so thick, we built a fire on the ice. And, and um, I don't know if I should admit this, but I, I picked up like a dirty stick off the ground and stuck a hot dog on it, and I, I cooked that over a fire on the ice and ate that. That was really fun. But like, the level of care and preparation that went into that food versus even the food cart. And you know, it's just all over the map. And the reason that's interesting is because with food, we've like reached this point in human society where we feel like we understand it, we understand what the risks are, and food has an acceptable level of risk for us. So what, what does that look like? Well, here in London, uh, it looks like food hygiene ratings on restaurants, right? Uh, so this is a picture from, I think, near Camden. And Every year, or periodically, uh, restaurants get evaluated on their food handling. And you can see the rating, and they have to comply, and we feel like, okay, there's an acceptable level of risk. Not every restaurant we eat at is rated a five, but it's okay. So what does that mean? Well, like, the main thing it means is wash your hands. There's a little bit of stuff about cross-contamination, but mostly it means wash your hands. And it's, it's the effort required to train people to wash their hands and for you to wash your hands is so low, and the benefit is so high, or the, the damage that will be done if you don't wash your hands is so high, that if you don't do it, society actually considers you negligent. It, you're doing wrong. Like, you are a bad person if you refuse to wash your hands. It doesn't matter how busy you are, how broke you are, how going out of business your restaurant is, everyone washes their hands. It doesn't matter how many employees, how fast the turnover, how many tables you seat each night, how tight your profit margin is, 
everybody washes their hands, right? Like it's, it's just done. And, and that acceptable level of risk, we're totally okay with 3,000 people a year dying. That's, that's uh, just in the US, so I couldn't find the numbers for the UK. Um, so we're not happy about 3,000 people a year dying, but we're, we're like reached this, this level where it's, we're okay with it. We understand that it would be so prohibitively expensive to get zero people dying that we can't do it. And washing your hands removes so much of it that, that it's okay. So this, this teaches us that it's not about being perfect, that like bad things are going to happen and we learn to cope with it. We reach this trade-off that we're okay with. We, we have some standards that anybody can meet and they're so unquestionably reasonable that anybody who doesn't follow those standards is just negligent. So when it comes to security, we need to start washing our hands. Um, and, there's, and there's also four other things that we should do, and I'll explain what these are. Go for walks, play with others, run in circles, and tell stories. So what might it mean to wash your hands? This will change over time, just like standards for food safety change over time as new threats emerge, right? There's an Ebola outbreak. We sort of change what the, what the requirements are, where that outbreak happens, maybe only temporarily. Um, so, so things shift, but, but basically wash your hands. What would that mean? Well, you should use a password manager. I know most people don't use a password manager. If you're not using a password manager, it's worse than not washing your hands. It's like you're actively bleeding into the food, right? <laughs> you have to go, go home from this conference and start using a password manager. That's, that's, so that's not, really, that's not really nearly good enough. You also need to be using multi-factor authentication, particularly on three things. Your password manager, the DNS records, if you have access to DNS records, like you have to be using two-factor on those, and on your email. And the reason that DNS and email are so important is because those are vectors by which people can get control of everything else, right? So even if you have really strong passwords, but someone can get access to your email, they can change your password, and, and they're right in. So it's really, really, really important. We also need to develop basic fluency in using encryption. We don't have to be experts on encryption. We don't have to make new encryption things. We just need to know the basic menu of options that exist and the human factors at play. So I'll, I'll uh, and I think the next slide, do a little crash course on encryption. But basically, you should be using full disk encryption on all of your devices, on your laptop, on your mobile phones. Like all of you in this room need, mo need full disk encryption on everything. It's not always straightforward to turn on. So it's not called full disk encryption, but there's a certain password that you set on your phone and boom, it's got full disk encryption. Um, on all of the systems that you work on, so like all of, the, all of the architecture diagrams that went up today, there should be encryption on all data at rest and in flight. And this is where I get really disappointed with the industry because all of the examples showing people how to use systems don't show them how to correctly put um, SSL or TLS in all of those places. And then you need to run this sort of continuous improvement loop, uh, which, are, which are the next steps. But I'll just, um, a quick crash course in encryption. So you turn on full disk encryption or you add SSL certificates. Uh, okay, that's great. Now how do you keep the keys safe? So basically, the encryption is not the hard part, uh, although it is really sophisticated. Everything reduces to a key management problem. How do you prove to an auditor or to a law enforcement agency or to yourself that the keys weren't misused, that you didn't look away for 30 seconds, that someone didn't grab that key and duplicate it? Another thing that you should know exists is called Shamir secret sharing. So uh, say you have offsite backups, those offsite backups are encrypted, or you have some other key material that's very, very valuable. Um, somebody has to have the key. So what happens if that person is bad or has a gun to their head or, or whatever? So a, th a thing that has existed for a very long time is secret sharing. So you can do N of M splits. What that means is, I take my key or my set of keys or whatever, I cut it into five pieces, say, and I want a two of five split or a three of seven split or whatever. Any one of those pieces is no good. It gives away no information. Uh, if it's a three of five split, I need three pieces of the key, any three pieces of the key, to be recombined to get a working key. So that, that has some really, really nice properties, right? It, it means one person can't go rogue. You have to have a conspiracy. It means that you have some redundancy. If two people lose their keys, you can still recover everything. It's a really, really powerful idea, and almost nobody knows about it. It's been around, it's been around forever. 
Another thing that you should know about is homomorphic encryption. You just need to know that it, it, this exists. Because as you're thinking about risks and as you're thinking about system design, knowing that this is possible really changes the conversation about what you should be doing. So this is a relatively new, new um, sort, of, sort of cutting edge in encryption. Sometimes it's called secure multi-party computation. Sometimes it's just called multi-party computation. But it's a way of encrypting a bunch of information, sending it off to a bunch of servers, and those servers work on the information. The information is encrypted before it gets to the servers. The servers never have the decrypted information. They do their work on the information, send it back, and you can recombine it, decrypt it, and get the actual results. Which means that you don't have to trust the servers, which means if someone breaks into the server, it doesn't matter. They couldn't do anything with the data. They don't know the decrypted data. So last year at a, a conference called um, Real World Cryptography, there were talks and, and demos about audio conferencing servers running at full speed, doing the multiplexing, without being able to read the data of the audio that they were multiplexing. There, they also had an example of a mail server applying server-side filters without being able to read the mail or the filters. So you just need to know that this exists, and if you have sensitive enough data that that's a good fit, knowing that it exists means you, means you can, you can uh, figure it out and use it. The of course, the best thing is don't pile up sensitive data for no reason. Define retention periods, right? If you don't have something there, then it's kind of hard to lose it. Uh, and I'll just plug Real World Crypto. It's in London this year, uh, in January. It's a fantastic conference. It's very, very cheap to get into. And they're exploring a lot of, a lot of these ideas. So if you want to learn a lot more about encryption, that's a great place to go. So go for walks. What does this mean? The reason that so many ideas come to us in the shower is because that's the most exercise we get. <laughs> so getting up from your desk and going for a walk and think, it changes your brain. And it really maximizes your ability to solve problems and to reflect and to have insights about problems that you're facing. So by going for a walk, and I, I mean a walk where you're not being like jostled and disturbed and like fighting to get onto the tube, but like a, a peaceful walk where you're not interrupted and can think peacefully and deeply for a few minutes, you'll suddenly gain much better insights into the risks that you face. So the really important thing here is to start thinking about the end games. So we spend, when we do think about security, we spend a hugely disproportionate amount of time on, and mental energy on prevention, which means that when things go wrong, we have no idea how to handle it. So the, the end game is this, you're going to get hacked. It's going to happen. So how do you handle it? How bad is the damage? How far does it spread? Where are the points that it stopped? Uh, it's like the restaurant, right? Germs exist, people are gonna die. Uh, is it, are you going to be considered negligent when that happens? Hopefully not. So be the data. Think about where it flows. Think about how you would defeat the system, right? I talk about backups, right? You, if you put a lot of encryption on the database and then you take this backup over here and you put it in somebody's pocket, then like, what, good was all of, what, what good was all of that? It just flowed over here and it could be lost. Um, and think about Think about where you've actually faced challenges. So I was working on one system, it stored patient data, and the way it worked is the medical staff would sign a patient in, um, and they would put some information in the system, and they would go about and go on and see the doctor. And we were really agonizing over the trade-offs of the different kinds of database encryption, and like we had some in-database encryption, and we wanted to do some encryption below the database, and, and you know, what, what should we do? And, and so I went for a walk. And as I was walking around the park, I realized, like, where have we actually lost data over the last few years? Where we've actually lost data is when a nurse would sign somebody into the system and accidentally sign them into the wrong person's record. And we could change that. We could completely change that by putting a picture on that login screen. And so the human factors part of it, making that super, super cheap change was way more important in terms of actually safeguarding the data than upgrading from one million uh, bit encryption to two million bit encryption or whatever, whatever it was that we're doing. Think about what breaches you actually face, what problems you actually have run into. So some example end games, uh, your sysadmin gets a keylogger. Well, it's not necessarily the end of the world if you're using two-factor auth, right? But think through that, think through that end game. Uh, what happens if your SSH private key gets stolen? How fast can you rekey? Do you have passphrases, all of that kind of stuff? What happens when an engineer actually adds SQL injection to your code? You can't just try harder and never make those mistakes. You have to think through what happens once this has gotten in. What happens when someone with access to the data goes rogue and sells it? What are you going to do? Um, 
part of what you need to do is tell people that that's happened, all right? And so playing through those end games will be really, really helpful for you. But that, that going for walks process is really called risk assessment. So it's, it's, how, um, it's, how, whoops, uh, it's how many systems define negligence. So once you have a duty to care about something and a reasonable person would know about what the result would be if you, if you haven't taken certain steps, then you have an obligation. So it doesn't mean that you have to make everything use secure multi-party computation. It just means you have to think about what the risks are and what would it cost to, to put some protections in place. If you're not doing risk assessments, you're already negligent. And, and I think that's one of the areas where we can improve the most. Um, so there's some more uh, about how to calculate that there. Uh, if you look at the hand rule, there's, there's great worksheets on, on how to do that. Um, once you've walked around and thought about this and you've identified some problems, then you need to get engaged with other people in your team. So group cognition is, is this really interesting phenomenon. And it's not called group think because that has these really negative, um, these really negative uh, feelings associated with it. But group cognition is when you start talking with other people about a problem and the interactions between individuals form an act of thinking or cognition. So one example is a team of people working on the nav crew of a large ship, right, and somebody's taking measurements, and somebody's looking at a map, and somebody's doing another thing, and somebody's turning the, turning the wheel. And between them, they form like this computer or brain that's, that's actually working. And so when you engage with others around your security problems, you get much, much better solutions. There's actually two really good card games out there that are designed to make it really easy to engage with other people in your team and, and to um, actually enjoy playing through some of those end games. So there's the Elevation of Privilege game, which is from Microsoft. You can Google that. There's free cards you can download. Um, and then the Open Web Application Security Project has also um, made a variation of that called Cornucopia. And remember, you don't have to solve everything. You just want to identify the risks, and then those can be evaluated. So then the next thing you need to do is run in circles. So this is just the, um, the famous John Boyd uh, OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. There's a million variations on this in a lot of the different um, agile literature about running a loop. So that remember those restaurant uh, evaluations? It wasn't you open a restaurant, you get a hygiene evaluation, and you're done. Like it's periodic. It, it runs a loop. And as threats change, as uh, people turn over, as everything happens, you periodically reevaluate that stuff. And so it's especially applicable to, to security. The threats are evolving. Your knowledge is changing. Your team is changing. You, you just don't ever get to put in place a perfect set of mitigations and then forget about things for the rest of the lifetime of your product. I, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've sat down for a routine review, kind of rolling my eyes, like, I know we need to do this. Um, there's no point. We did it three months ago. I already know everything in that document. And we sit down, and we talk about it for 15 minutes. Um, and we, usually, we try and walk and get a coffee. And every time, we discover something new. We remember a, an interesting variation. And we make things just a little bit better. It's really, really worth it. And the final thing you need to do is to tell stories. So telling stories is how we learn, and it's how we influence this culture that we all share in our companies and our peer groups. Security is constantly left out of demos and examples, and we need to change this. This is why I came to the conference today, is, is I'm really frustrated with security. It's, it's causing problems, and I want to tell stories, and I want to hear stories, and I want to talk together with, with my peers about making this better. Um, so some stories that are already out there, some information that is really, really wonderful, um, there's, there's, uh, I talked about open web application security. SSL and TLS, there's a great book that um, Ivan Uristic published just recently. It's absolutely amazing. I can guarantee you most people are doing their SSL configuration wrong, so that, that's a great book. Catalyze IO, I just want to call this company out. They're a small startup. They actually published like 30 security policies, and they've been through two or three very, very rigorous audits, and those policies have been open sourced. So you can grab all of those policies and immediately get a really great starting place for your, for your team or for your company. What I'm really missing is more stories about key management. Like, I, I need help with this. There, there are, must be people doing a good job of it, and we don't ever talk about key management. So that's it. Wash your hands, which means take reasonable basic precautions. Go for walks, which means schedule time to reflect on your risk. Uh, play with others, engage in group problem solving and around threat modeling, run that OODA loop, and um, tell stories. Take this message and, and help your colleagues value meaningful security and reject the, the FUD and annoyance factors so that we can start doing a better job of this. 
Right, thank you.